What is the underlying nature of reality? For Thales, the essence of the world was water. For the Stoics, it was Logos. For Heraclitus, the universe consisted fundamentally of fire, life energy, or the thinking faculty. The search for the building blocks of our world has a rich philosophical history and today is intertwined with cutting-edge research in the physical sciences. In this episode, we'll be focusing on those who defend the idea of substances. According to this view, at the heart of our cosmos exist simple, independent, ungrounded entities called substances, from which everything else in the world is made and sustained. Perhaps these are particles, strings, or space-time. Maybe they're consciousness, selves, or gods. Our guide to substances and the nature of reality is Dr. Dunica O'Connell, postdoctoral researcher at the University of Freiburg, Switzerland. Dr. O'Connell currently working on the Swiss National Science Foundation project, the subject of experiences, has made several important contributions to the literature, including through his recent book, Substance, published by Cambridge University Press. As we shall see, Dr. O'Connell is a leading scholar on the role and nature of substances, as well as the contentious question of their existence. Ultimately, that's our focus, whether the world depends on independent, ungrounded entities and what these hidden entities might look like. Hello and welcome to episode 123 of the Pan Psycast. I'm the bundle of particles that is Jack Symes and I'm delighted to be joined once again by the man who has been shared by multiple entities, it's Mr. Ollie Marley. Hello. And the ontologically independent Dr. Dunica O'Connell. How do? Thank you for joining us on the show, Dunica. It's great to have you with us. It's great to be here. So the first question we ask all of our guests, we often joke that it's deceptively difficult, although perhaps it's quite straightforward in comparison to grappling with the fundamental nature of reality. In your view, Dunica, what is philosophy? There's a reason why people say it's deceptively difficult, because it's actually more difficult than it seems, and it seems pretty difficult. I think it's a hard question to answer straightforwardly, which which in itself, the fact that it's hard in itself says quite a lot, I think. You can consider philosophy as a kind of a practice and a kind of tradition or a set of traditions that have accrued over time. And I think part of what marks those traditions out is that they're concerned with a certain sort of questioning, where you're putting into question or you're examining things that we typically take completely for granted, not only in our everyday lives, but even in other branches of inquiry in other disciplines. Other disciplines will ask, how can we know about a certain topic or a certain subject matter? Let's say, how can we know about molecules or how can we know about um, species? Whereas a philosophy question, one one classic example of a, of a philosophy question is, what is it to know or what is knowledge? Mm. And then following on from that, there might be a very general question of What can we know, generally speaking? Philosophical questions like those are very, very general in their scope, and they often put into question things that we take completely for granted. Right. If I was going to point at one thing that that makes a an inquiry or a discussion distinctively philosophical, it would probably be that. Probably. It would probably be that. Now, Dunica, as well as specialising in consciousness and the nature of conscious experiences, much of your current work centres around discussions in contemporary metaphysics. Uh, For listeners who don't know, could you tell us what metaphysics involves and how you came to be interested in it? I've had a rather unusual route into metaphysics because I did my bachelor's degree a long time ago in Cork, which is where I'm from in Ireland. And there was a module in metaphysics, Mm. but and it was taught by a lovely, lovely man um, who I think was a Franciscan. and it was entirely on the work of Aquinas. Mm. Oh, and cool. it was pretty hard going for a second year undergraduate. And it left me with a quite distinctive impression of what metaphysics was about and not a particularly favorable <laughs> one. And I, I should say that nowadays I wouldn't be nearly as, I wouldn't have nearly as strong a view on, on the work of Aquinas. But at the time, there were, shall we say, minimal concessions made to people who were not already mm. on board with the importance of, of his work. And what got me drawn into metaphysics if you like, again, and successfully was um, I did my PhD at Durham University. And one of my supervisors was Jonathan Lowe, Mm. who publishes or published under the name E.J. Lowe. And he was a very, very prominent metaphysician. And among other things, he also wrote on a number of other topics. And it was really through discussions with him and also reading his work that I got interested in metaphysics. And also that route into metaphysics 
is what inclines me to answer the first question you asked in a particular way. My response will be quite on the lines of low metaphysics is something like a systematic study of the fundamental structure and nature of what exists, where what exists includes also what is the case, what occurs. You could be talking about physical reality. You can also ask metaphysical questions concerning, for instance, numbers and other mathematical entities. Mm. You could ask metaphysical questions about God, whether there is such a thing, and if there is such a thing, what would God's nature be? Mm. In theory, you can ask metaphysical questions about anything, but the overall project of metaphysics is tying together specific metaphysical claims about specific kinds of things. Mm. So you could have a view of the metaphysics of artifacts, a view of the metaphysics of persons, a view of the metaphysics of numbers, and metaphysics as an overall project is looking for connections between them. And at this point, it's pretty much um, inevitable that someone's going to mention Seller's comment about <laughs> asking the question about how things in the broadest sense um, hang together in the broadest sense. That's a that's a paraphrase. Um, but it's a very good paraphrase. And I've, I'm, I'm aware that other people in this chair, so to speak, have had recourse to that quotation in previous episodes. But I think it's a great quotation. And I think it's it's apropos for philosophy, but it's particularly apropos, I think, for metaphysics. I was wondering when Sellers was going to come out, to be honest. It's talking about metaphysics, it always okay, does. So if, you, if, if you've got your Sellers bingo card, you can, you can shout now and take it off. <laughs> <laughs> so many of the philosophers that we speak to tell us that they've had intellectual heroes who have inspired them on their philosophical journeys. I'm sure there are many that come to mind for yourself, but is there a particular figure, with the exception of E.J. Lowe, who has had a notably significant impact on your own thinking? Well, yeah, um, present company excluded, Jack. Um, <laughs> Let me see. <laughs> well, low would have been the obvious answer. Um, the I did my PhD on the work of Edmund Husserl. Mm. Husserl was interested in metaphysical questions, but the way he approached them is very different. He came from a quite different tradition. He's someone who in some sense is an intellectual hero. He's someone who, whose work really dug its hooks into me mm. uh, when I was an undergraduate. And for a while, I was much more interested in, in Husserl's work and in Husserl, particularly in his more mature phenomenologies, transcendental idealism. Right. I was much more interested in that. Mm. And subsequently, I've moved away a little from that. I should also say, by the way, Husserl is an extraordinarily difficult philosopher to read. Yeah. So I seem to recall that I read a fairly short book of his called Cartesian Meditations. And I'm pretty sure the first time I read it, I misunderstood <laughs> it thoroughly. And so I would recommend to people listening, if you are interested in Husserl, it's well worth exploring. But it's also well worth starting with someone who is not Husserl. And there's a number of very, very good introductions written by other people. And I'd highly recommend starting with one of those and then going on to look at Husserl. Nowadays, not so much an intellectual hero, but in terms of someone who was very important to me in getting me into philosophy more deeply, mm. I would say he's a person who comes to mind straight away. The topic of our episode is going to be on substances today. And before we dive into their nature and the question of their existence, could you tell us a little bit about what it is that motivates your inquiry into these things? You know, in other words, why do you believe that thinking about substances matters? I mean, one of the reasons is that, as I mentioned previously, I was very influenced by the work of Lowe. And Lowe is a self-described substance ontologist. In his sense of ontology, ontology refers to the most general categories to which entities belong. So we're not, we're not talking here about categories like, let's say, electron mm. or a species that one belongs to, or even a category like being in space or time. We're talking about categories like being an event. And so event will be one, will be one candidate category. Property would be another category. And for low substance is another category on top of that. So one answer to your question is that it's by engaging with 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 Jonathan's work. Mm. Of course, I think what you're really getting at is what's the intellectual significance mm. of, of this, of thinking about these problems. One answer you could give there is talk about the history of philosophy. If you look at the history of metaphysics, and I'm not a historian of, of philosophy, but I have a kind of a working knowledge, shall we say, of, of the of the ladybird version of Western <laughs> metaphysics. The notion of substance is extremely important there. And it's, it recurs in Aristotle. It's, it was very, very dominant in the Middle Ages and in the early modern period. Um, philosophers like um, Descartes, Leibniz and Spinoza talked a lot about it. It's, got, it's, it's waxed and waned in its importance. But over the course of let's, uh, certainly the Western tradition, and my understanding is also there are equivalent notions which play an important role in other traditions such as Indian philosophy. Mm. But in the Western tradition, it's clearly one very important thread. So, that, so that's one important use to which one could put the notion. One, one could inquire into the history of philosophy. That's not my primary interest. 
And I'm saying this because a lot of people, when they hear or when they think about the notion of substance, they are primed to think in terms of Aristotle's mm. view or Descartes' view and so on and so forth. Right. And those views are certainly important and certainly worth taking seriously. As it happens, they're not the views that I'm primarily interested mm. in. And in the book, I don't really engage with them except by way of a fairly cursory overview. What I would say to your listeners is that if they are interested in the history of substance, the Stanford Encyclopedia entry on substance is much more historically inclined. Now, it does also, of course, cover um, recent developments, mm. but it has a much more extensive overview of the history of substance. So that's a very good place to start if one's interested in that topic. Okay, but I still haven't answered your question. Um, <laughs> And so I'm going to maybe just lay my cards on the table here without trying to defend each card as I turn it over. In general, metaphysical inquiry is is worth pursuing for its own sake. Mm. It seems to me to be legitimate to ask the following question. Are there any entities, if, you, if we look at the world around us and we also consider various fairly well-established scientific theories, so we're talking about a view of the world, which is not simply a matter of, of naive common sense, but it's nor is it simply committed to, to a particular scientific outlook. If we look at a view which seeks to combine both of those, then it's reasonable to inquire into the structure, how these different things relate to each other. Yeah. How do the ordinary objects like tables and books and trees relate to the kind of entities and processes and laws that are discussed by the different sciences. And one way to think about all that, which again, in, in the background here is, is Setters, once again, the um, the manifest image and the scientific image. And one, one can think of the manifest image and the scientific image as competing. And the question is, how do, how do we reconcile them? I don't really think of, of the, the relation between the everyday worldview and the scientific worldview in those terms. It's not obvious to me that they compete. Mm. But even if they don't compete, we can still ask the question, how do they hook together? Mm. And one might think, well, there's a structure here of dependence, or one might say of ontological priority. One might say, for instance, that an entity like a tree or a mountain is somehow built out of other entities. It's governed by the, those other entities, their properties, the way they're put together. And thinking in those terms will naturally lead one then to think, well, mm -hmm. are there any entities which are, so to speak, at the bottom of the chain? Right. Which are the basement, foundation of the whole apparatus. In some sense, those entities and the way that they are and maybe relations between them, if you like, govern or lay down everything else. Then substance, it turns out, is one prominent candidate to play such a role. It's, not, it's by no means the only candidate, but it is one prominent candidate. It's a quite strong candidate. And so it's a candidate that's certainly worth taking seriously. So in a way, that's my starting point. You start with a common sense view, plus you want to take the scientific discoveries and well-established theories seriously. You then ask, how do they hook together? And that, I think, leads you, not inevitably, I'm not saying this is a kind of a logical deduction, but I'm saying it's a very natural way to go, that you're inquiring into what are the most fundamental entities at the bottom of it all. Okay, it seems we're on the cusp of the main substance of the episode, so I think it's time for us to jump into part one. Part 1. Substance. One popular way of understanding the world's nature is that it's hierarchical. The bigger things like skyscrapers, surfboards, sandals, the three examples used earlier of books or things like tables or even mountains, are made up of smaller constituents. And perhaps these are things like neutrons and electrons. Do you think that's the best way to approach the question of substances? You know, in other words, your, your question is, what are the bedrock entities, the fundamental units of reality? I think it's a way to approach the question. And it's a way that actually I, I appreciate that the examples I chose a moment ago quite possibly suggested that way. I think I might have even said that certain common or garden everyday entities are built up out of other ones. So that does encourage the thought that what we're looking for are the things that are more fundamental and that are also smaller physical entities. Mm. And that is certainly one approach which has been very fruitful in many sciences. And it's an approach which is taken seriously by many metaphysicians. I do think it's not the only approach, though. Mm. What I'd like to do is keep a fairly open mind as to which route we ought to take and what assumptions we ought to make about what the most fundamental ent entities might turn out to be. So one view is that the most fundamental entities will turn out to be something like a certain class of microparticles, okay. possibly particles we haven't discovered yet. When those particles are arranged in various ways, they create other particles, which create molecules and so on and so forth. Mm. So that, that's one route you could take. Mm -hmm. But there's, there's two things to say about that, to, which complicate the picture slightly. You could take the view seriously that 
the most fundamental scientifically discoverable entities, mm. they are the ones that we ought to take to be fundamental and to be perhaps the best candidate to be substances, but we ought not assume that they are microparticles. There's at least two other kinds of options we could be looking at. One of them is that we could be looking at space-time as a whole. Mm -hmm. So maybe rather than being built up out of out of microparticles, and the microparticles are in some way the, mo the most fundamental entities, it might be that space-time as a whole is the most fundamental entities. Mm. And then there's some other way in which um, ordinary objects like trees and tables are in some sense carved out of or depend upon space-time. So that's one thing to, to be said. Another possibility is that particles and space-time are both themselves dependent on something else, mm. which is not itself spatiotemporal in nature. And here you have a lot of different speculations. So p some people have suggested seriously that ultimately the universe is mathematical, mm. not just in the sense that mathematical physics is a very good way to describe it, but that in some sense, mathematical entities and structures are the underlying nature of reality. So there's a physicist, Max Tegmark, for instance, has, has put this view forward quite seriously. So that's one complication to note. The other complication is that you could say, well, maybe... The most fundamental entities are going to be entities that we would describe as fairly straightforwardly physical, like, for instance, microparticles posited in some hypothetical complete physics. But you could also take seriously the option that maybe they will turn out to be something else. And we're not talking about space time here or mathematical entities. Maybe among the fundamental entities might be, so someone might say God, for example, mm. but someone might also say persons or subjects. Mm -hmm. Or someone might say certain values are fundamental. They're, they're fundamentally part of, of what exists or what is the case. At this stage, when you're just asking the question for the first time, the kind of examples we've been discussing might lead one in a certain direction. But I think it's quite important to keep our options open here. Hmm. And of course, I should say one other thing, which we'll probably come back to. In asking this question and in considering possible answers, one answer that we have to keep on the table, I think, is that it might turn out that there are no such entities. Uh. It might turn out that the category of substance is empty. And that, in fact, there are no fundamental building blocks of reality, mm. that, in fact, reality is, is structured in a quite different way. The central idea, then, is that the world is made up of fundamental building blocks from which everything else is created. Or it could be the case that that's true, that there is something that satisfies the thing you're calling substance. And these things stand under the world. These entities can't be reduced to anything more basic as well. And from the history of philosophy, I think we've mentioned a few examples already. You're mentioning space-time. I think Newton thought that time and space were substances. From our episode on Epicurus, the atomists thought there were an infinite number of atoms. They were the fundamental building blocks. And I think you mentioned Descartes earlier on as well. This Descartes thought there were two types, the extended and the non-extended substances. Those are examples, though. And we're yet to carve out what it is that these examples have in common. What is it, do you think, Donica, it is to be a substance? How can we clarify this concept further and so we can start to see which sort of things fit the criteria for being a substance? What we've been discussing, you might call, and in the book, I, I refer to it as a certain sort of role so that you, that one might posit an entity to play or one might have an entity in mind that's capable of playing this role. And that role is the role of being something like a fundamental, irreducible entity. Mm. And also, you might add, this entity, perhaps together with some other entities, in some sense underwrites or can be appealed to in explaining why everything else is the way it is. So that's if you like, the role. And, and of course, that role can be clarified and sharpened in various ways. Right. In the history of philosophy, and, and nowadays as well, there's a number of different rival candidates to play that role. So some people have thought that properties uh, are capable of playing that role. So for example, you might take the property of a book, which has a certain shape, has a certain color, has a certain size. All of these are properties of the book. Mm. And we naturally attribute the properties to the book. Mm. We say that the book is a certain shape. And if we're speaking philosophically, we might say the book has the property of being a certain shape. And there's a way of looking at that which says that the properties are actually fundamental, that the book is something like a construction out of the properties or a bundle of the properties. Yeah. So that the fundamental entities, the entities which are best suited to play this role, are themselves nothing but the properties. Mm. And I would regard that as a rival account to the substance account. So I assume that substances in the philosophically most interesting sense are not themselves properties. Mm. So 
well, what's the difference? Well, one difference is that I assume, and this is kind of going all the way back to something very suggestive Aristotle said, the thought is that substances are not themselves properties or features or qualities of anything else. So for the sake of argument, let's just suppose that Jack is a substance. <laughs> so Jack is among the fundamental building blocks of reality, let's just say. And I mean, and there are views that take that, that thought seriously, not just Jack, of course. Um, <laughs> and the idea is that Jack has properties, he bears properties. Yeah. But he is not himself a property of anything else. It would be a kind of a category error mm. to say that, to, to, to predicate Jack of something else, or to say that Jack is a property or a quality or a feature of something else. So substances are not properties. They're not themselves features of something else. And the, the further thought would be then that you can't analyze substance in terms of some entities being a certain way or having a certain property. And the contrast here is with something like an event. So consider the event of my holding up my hand and closing my fingers to form a fist. Mm. So that's, that's, a, that's a fairly straightforward, familiar event. You can understand that event in different ways. One very popular way is to say that it's something like my hand undergoing a certain modification, yeah. a modification with respect to its shape. At the start, it's one shape, my fingers are extended, and then the shape modifies so that, so that the fingers and the thumb clench together. Mm. And the idea is that, again, substances are not only just not properties, they're not events. You can't understand what they are as modifications of some other entity. To some extent, we're giving negative characterizations here, yeah. but we can see the outline as well of something positive, that substances, one thing you would say is that they're particular entities, mm -hmm. which is to say they're not just to contrast them with universals. If you have a, an individual substance, again, going back to Jack, we can't literally speak of different instances of Jack mm. in the same way that we could speak of different instances of a certain color, let's say. So you could have different objects that share the same color. You, in that case, you would have different instances of the same color property. We could not literally say if Jack is a substance, we couldn't literally speak of instances of Jack in the same way. So we can say substances are particulars in that way. We can say that substances aren't properties. So properties would give one rival way of thinking of what the, um, the fundamental entities are. Mm. Substances aren't events. Substances are not states of affairs. We're making some progress there, partly by means of contrasting the category of substance with other rival categories. And one of the ways we do this is by simply laying down certain stipulations. But another way we, we, we can do it, which is, is by giving clear examples of th things that we clearly think are not substances mm. and in a way that's easier to do than giving clear examples of what are substances because one of the things i talk about in the book is that different philosophers with different starting points have very very different views as to what substances could turn out to be mm -hmm. but i think pretty much everyone would be agreed that the event of my clenching my hand to form a fist is not a good candidate to be a substance yeah. In other words, if, you're, if your understanding of what a substance is leaves open that that's a good candidate, then you thereby have good reason to revisit your view of what a substance is. Let us pause for a moment to say a quick thank you to all of our virtuous patrons for enabling the show to flourish. In particular, a very special thank you to the man throwing out his leather jacket, it's Mr. Adam Cool. Oat milk and two sugars, it's Mr. T. He's not a sacrificial lamb, he's a very naughty boy. It's the life of Brian. Ramirez. Round and round she goes, searching for her species-specific end. Little does she know that she's already there. It's Miss Lily Hooper. Accidentally vegan, it's Andrew Sherman. Saving the planet one leg-powered aquatic journey at a time, it's Pedalo Monte Jano. He can't give up the cheese, it's John Breeden. Can vegans enjoy other people's sliver? Well, don't tell Michael Kisley. Speeding towards animal injustice, just ignore her carbon footprint, is Vivian Carrera. Freeing racehorses and taking them for leisurely strolls, it's Walker Barnes. And last but not least, his name is bigger than a humpback whale, with more consonants than an elephant has neutrons. Its pronunciation can only be grasped by dolphins through echolocation, it's Moron van der Kolk. If you're enjoying the show and you want to help us fulfill our ends, then please head over to patreon.com forward slash pansycast to show your support. A link is also in the iTunes description. Right, let's jump back into it. In your book, you propose the idea that substances are independent, that they aren't determined by anything else, that they are ungrounded, that they aren't made to exist by anything else. And they're ultimate, that they exist in their own right. They're simple. And if I'm not sure if I'm phrasing this correctly, that they can be unified. Now, I guess our audience can decide whether Jack can be all of those things uh, and be a substance. But would you mind just elaborating on this final criterion for us? 
Does it mean that the fundamental building blocks must be able to combine with other fundamental building blocks in order to be one of the fundamental building blocks of reality? I'm inclined to say no, because I want to leave open the possibility that there there is only one fundamental building block, which of course, in a way, is, yeah. is, is, it sounds very odd and it really strains the metaphor, uh, which is already <laughs> pretty strange, it has to be said. Um, but if one thinks that there's just a single substance, be it God, be it space-time, it seems very odd to, to, to insist that this entity must be able to combine with other fundamental entities, given that you've, your starting point is that there are no, no such other fundamental entities. But if we assume that there are multiple substances, mm. then depending on what we take them to be, you recall that the, the initial idea we started with was this idea of figuring out the structure mm-hmm. of reality as, as it strikes us, mm. first off the bat. And one way to go is to think of certain things as constituted by or as built up from other entities. And certainly if you take that view seriously and you think that substances are the fundamental things at the bottom level, which which then can be combined in various ways to form other entities. If you take that view, then yes, it's going to be important to have something positive to say about how substances can tie together yeah. to form other entities. I do want to maybe go back, though, on some of the, the criteria you mentioned. I think, I mean, you mentioned several there. You mentioned that they're independent, they're ungrounded, mm. and they don't exist in virtue of anything else, I think you said. And you, you mentioned unity and simplicity. I think I'd m- maybe just slightly clarify there. In the book, I, I discuss these proposed criteria I think I call them their 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 proposed criteria on substancehood, on being a substance. Mm. Mm. And some of these criteria, I think, are more plausible than others. You might recall that a moment ago I was talking that I was saying that we could illustrate to some degree our preferred idea of substance by contrasting it with cases that pretty clearly aren't substances. And the, the example I used is of, yeah. of clenching my hand to form a fist. Mm. In the case of unity, I think we can do the same thing. I think we can we can contrast the notion of substance with some entity or maybe plurality of entities, which in some important sense lacks unity. So some philosophers speak of, of there being sums or, or aggregates or groups. Mm. So an aggregate or group, it could you could be talking about, let's say, all the ants in a colony mm-hmm. might be one aggregate. But you could also talk about all the entities on my desk as being an aggregate. The basic idea here is that if one allows that there are such things as aggregates or groups, then some of these will be much more unified than others. Mm-hmm. So the entities on my desk, they are unified. You know, they're all they're all unified in space and time. They're all present on my desk. But in many other respects, they're not unified. Whereas the colony of ants, each member of that colony is unified by belonging to a species. And they also, in some sense, functionally work together to build up the colony. For something to be a kind of a viable candidate to be a substance, it must be really very strongly integrated. Mm. So a recent philosopher who's done really interesting work on this is Catherine Koslicki. So Koslicki actually is a bit sceptical of some of the other criteria I've mentioned, like independence. She takes more seriously the idea that the mark of substancehood is to be very, very highly integrated in a certain way. Yeah. Where very, very roughly, the mark is that the different parts of the entity mm. must hook together in such a way that their combined working together is crucial to the overall functioning or what it is mm. that the entity does. So you can illustrate this basic principle with, with regard to artifacts, with, with regard to the way the different parts of a laptop work together. You can illustrate it with regard to organisms. If one stretches the, the notion of function broadly enough, one can also illustrate it with respect to things like, for example, molecule. And Koslicki, I think she's kind of sceptical of the idea that that grave substance is an on or off thing. So I'm inclined to think that something either is a substance or is not. There aren't degrees of substancehood. Mm. And I, so I want to say that if unity is a criteria, and substancehood, you reach a certain threshold of unity and anything that falls below that threshold cannot be a substance. Anything that goes above it at least is a good candidate to be a substance. So throughout this instalment, we've danced around some of the various candidates for the role of fundamental building block or substances. And I think a lot of people listening are going to think that the findings of physics offer a best bet. Can we say, simply put, that whatever particles that physics identifies as the substances of the world, when they can't dig any deeper, are the particles that constitute the substance of the world? In other words, whatever physics tells us is at the very bottom of everything, is what's at the very bottom of everything. I want to make clear, I don't think that's necessarily wrong. Mm. I don't have any particular axe to grind against that view. Um, so what I'd say is that for all we know, that might turn out to be correct. I do think there are a couple of complications that are worth mentioning, though. So one of them is that it seems to me that there is not very broad agreement among physicists as to what the fundamental entities might be. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned particles, but it, but of course, some physicists take seriously the thought that the fundamental entities are not particles. There, there might be space time or there might be 
um, some other sort of formation or structure. Mm. Another complication is that there's there's an argument which has been made that the history of science, and in particular the history of physics, suggests that it may be futile to expect that we're going to reach a fundamental level below which we, we, we cannot go. Although, of course, it might be that we'll reach a level of bedrock which proves extremely difficult mm. to go below in practical terms. Because, for example, we, we literally might not have machines capable of generating the energy to carry out further um, experiments. Mm. That's, if you like, a practical limitation. And it's not clear mm. under what circumstances one could thereby conclude that we've reached what is literally the bedrock of physical reality. There's interesting questions there as to whether it's reasonable to expect even a, a, um, a body of work as, as successful as physics to provide a very conclusive answer to that question, the question of what is the ultimate nature of, of, of physical reality. It's quite possible to acknowledge what you're saying that it's it's reasonable to take physics to be a very good guide to uncovering at least some of the fundamental entities. It's reasonable to think that and also to think there might be other candidates which are good for other reasons where physics might not have anything to tell us about them. So one one such example, which I mentioned previously, might be certain sorts of mathematical structures. Another might be persons or subjects of experience. And depending and again so so i mean one could also talk about values but i think the way that i understand values values being things like just things like goodness or badness but i think they're more naturally understood i would i would be inclined to understand those as more like mm. properties insofar as we're looking for candidate substances i think i think we could set those aside if we think there's reasons to think that persons are candidate substances we probably aren't going to expect that we can give an account of what a person is in terms of the findings of physics. One might also think the same thing about organisms. Now, this is a bit more controversial because, of course, there is a part, I think, of the layperson's worldview. Well, biology can be reduced to chemistry, can be reduced to physics. But I think it's fair to say that not all philosophers of biology um, accept that view. And so if you take the idea of what's sometimes called ontological emergence seriously, one would at least then take seriously the thought that maybe certain sorts of entity, perhaps organisms, perhaps persons, they will exist only perhaps when the laws of physics and arrangements of physical entities allow them to exist, but they are not themselves reducible to certain patterns of physical activity or certain arrangements of physical entities. So if one makes those assumptions, one will be able to put further candidate substances on the table, be they persons, be they organisms. So, okay, then, someone could argue if the world is made up of fundamental entities, then there will be the simple, combinable, independent, ultimate units at the bedrock of the world. Yet you haven't given us any real reasons as to why we should think these substances exist. In fact, just then you were a bit sceptical of physics's ability to do so. So in your view, Danica, what are the best arguments for the existence of substances? Okay, so I'm, I must confess at this point, I'm not clear that there's any really strong arguments for the existence of substance. The category of substance is a very interesting one. And the question of whether there are substances and other related questions are very interesting and worth exploring. Mm. But like a number of other areas in metaphysics, what we find is a plethora of competing theories and views hmm. and not a whole lot of agreement. The short answer is that I don't think it's reasonable to expect there to be any sort of knockdown argument. Part of what you find is some substance theorists will simply work with um, certain paradigm cases. Hmm. They'll simply say, well, I'm, I'm assuming for the sake of my argument that such and such a thing is a substance. And generally speaking, the examples that they choose will not be terribly controversial. To give a historical example, Aristotle, who some people think is the first person to talk about substance in, in the sense that we've been discussing. He introduces the notion of substance and gives examples of things like horses. Hmm. And I think he might give an example of persons as well. And of course, most of us will, will, would agree that horses and persons exist. And what's at issue is whether they they really carry this, this ontological weight hmm. that we want to assign to substances. So the first point to make is that one could appeal to examples, but those are only going to take you so far. What we'd really like, I suppose, is an overall argument that the best way to think about the world is in terms of its containing fundamental entities and the best candidates are these are substances. Probably the best known of these is an argument from vicious regress. Hmm. So the thought is, let's 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 go back to the, 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 the picture we started with, which is of, of a world full of ordinary everyday objects. And we can start asking questions about what depends on what or why does such and such a thing exist? Yeah. One could start answering those questions in terms of what causes what. But what we have in mind here is something a little bit different. It's more like what constitutes what, what makes something the case. Mm. So the thought is, just to give an example, uh, the desk at which I'm sitting, one can give a causal explanation of why the table exists and why the table is in my room 
But the kind of explanation we're looking for is a little bit different. It, w- it would be something like, what does the table consist in? Mm-hmm. Or um, we try and give, some, you might want to give some kind of analysis of what it is for the table to exist. And it seems, or at least many people think, if there is an, a positive answer to such a question to be given, it would not list the actual causes of the table, mm. being that a carpenter made certain bits of wood and certain other people maybe fitted it together, the different parts. So that looks like a perfectly valid answer to one question, but it's not the answer to the particular question we're looking for. Mm-hmm. So then the idea is that, okay, we're, 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 we start with a question along the lines of we're looking for a certain sort of explanation of why there are entities of a very general sort, yeah. ordinary, everyday entities like um, tables, trees, uh, mountains, and so on. Mm. And we're looking for an explanation of, of what their existence consists in. And the thought is that if we answer by positing other things, we can ask the same question again. What, like, for instance, we can answer by positing the existence of molecules. And then we say, well, what does the existence of molecules consist in? Mm. And then we go to atoms. And then the question arises again. There's a kind of a principled problem with this kind of answer. Right. You never reach a fully satisfying answer, an answer that kind of closes off the inquiry, as long as the answer to each specific question posits an entity which itself stands in need of an explanation of the same sort. Mm. The kind of problem which you're trying to answer recurs at every level. And some people think that this is a sign that something's gone wrong with the explanatory project in the first place, and that the only way to really solve this is to say that there must be entities at some level where you cannot give a positive answer of that sort. There must be entities where you cannot say what it is for this entity to exist is blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And those entities will be ontologically irreducible and fundamental. And sometimes people illustrate this by reference to examples where it seems intuitively that something's gone wrong. So an example, a classic example, will a scientist is given a lecture and at the end of the lecture, the scientist is approached by the member of the public mm. and the lecture was about the Earth and the solar system and, and its place in the galaxy. The member of the public rebukes the scientist and says, well, you're wrong because what's actually going on is that the Earth is sitting on the back of a giant turtle. <laughs> and the scientists ask, well, what's the turtle sitting on? And the answer is famously, turtles all the way down. <laughs> and the thought here is that There's a lot of problems with that explanation. Hmm. There are many, many problems. But one of the problems is that it just doesn't seem like a very good explanation, even even waiving all the other issues to do with lack of evidence. I I mean, in this case, the turtles wouldn't be floating through space, actually. So I was going to say they're floating through space, but they're stacked in space. (laughs) But the the thought might be that, well, in a sense, that explanation goes wrong right off the bat. So I I should say not everyone shares this intuition. Mm -hmm. But the idea is that if you find that kind of explanation just a non-starter from the word go, you'll feel the pull of the idea that an explanation of that sort can't go on forever and ever and ever. It must bottom out. Mm. So that's one part of the answer, that there's an argument for fundamental level. And then in terms of, well, what are the best candidates? You then have to go into the nitty gritty of substance theories battling it out with other candidate theories. So yeah. so I'll just very briefly talk about one, one possible candidate, the idea that the fundamental entities are properties. Mm. What's most fundamental are properties, and everything else is somehow built out of properties instantiated together in various ways. Mm. The book I'm looking at now has certain properties. There were the, sorry, the copy of this book has certain properties. But metaphysically speaking, what's really going on there is that the properties are prior to the book. The book is nothing but an appropriate bundle of the properties. Mm. We can generalize a little bit more and say that it's a, it's a view of everything else except the properties themselves. That literally everything is, is, is just a, a, an appropriate bundle of or a configuration of of properties. And this view faces well-known problems, some of which are a bit technical and fussy, but the overall structure of the argument here is that if we agree that there must be, or we have reason to think that there are some fundamental entities, Mm. we're then looking to compare and contrast and weigh up against each other the competing theories. And at least some of the rival theories on offer, the view that properties are fundamental, the view that facts are fundamental, which, for instance, the logical atomists seem to seem to hold. Um, so at one stage in his career, Bertrand Russell seemed to think this. And it's suggested, at least, by things that Wittgenstein says in the Tractatus. Mm. Um, although, of course, he also subsequently said that it was all nonsense. <laughs> um, he said that in the same book. So it's hard to see whether one, how, how exactly one reads that. One has to take it seriously, but not literally. Mm. These are rival views. And part of what's going to go on is that you're going to have a, a, an argument for and against where you're kind of pointing to the errors or the weaknesses in these views. And then proponents of those views are going to argue against substance theories. So it's going to get down to that level of nitty gritty. So the short answer to your question is that probably we can't expect a really neat argument as to why there must be substances as opposed to fundamental entities of some kind. We're running out of time, so I don't think we've got chance for me to ask my question about turtles all the way down and defend the view. (laughs) 
in any detail. <laughs> so we're going to leave it there for now. But in our next installment, we're going to be exploring some of the main objections to the existence of substances. But for now, their existence is going to remain a mystery. The, the mystery, mystery philosopher. Welcome to Mystery Philosopher, Mr. Ollie Marley. Can you remind us of the rules? So we're going to hear the voice of a potentially deceased philosopher, uh, and we have me yeah, and Dunnegan have to guess who it is. Uh, yeah, they are deceased we, this time as well. They are deceased, so. yeah, good. Huh? Cla- clarifying that, I appreciate that. Besides this, the indivisible and solid bodies out of which two the compounds are created and into which they are dissolved have an incomprehensible number of varieties in shape. For it is not possible that such great varieties of things should arise from the same atomic shapes, if they are limited in number. And so, in each shape the atoms are quite infinite in number, but their differences of shape are not quite infinite, but only incomprehensible in number. Who might that be? Any guesses? Uh, so it's talking about atoms. Is it Epicurus? It's Epicurus, very good, Mr. Oh, Marley. Nice. Uh, the <laughs> I actually I, I I I could say that I was about to say that, but in all honesty, <laughs> I actually don't know. I, 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 like I said, I'm, I'm not a, a very well versed in the history of philosophy, so I think you would have got it with the clues. There were going to be he's got green fingers and he died of kidney <laughs> stones. There's not many people in the history of philosophy that can claim those two things. Thank you for joining us for another installment of the Pan Psychast. The next installment is already available on Patreon, so head over there to support the show and get early access. And thank you for wanting to know more today than you did yesterday. (laughs) 